All right, so now that the housekeeping is done and in order, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Moira Smith. Um, she really doesn't need an introduction in our circles uh, because she's such an active part um, of the geological community, both technically and socially, um, but I'm gonna give one anyways. So Moira is currently uh, Vice President Exploration for Liberty Gold. She's also a director at um, Discovery Metals. And she has over 25 years experience working in, in copper and gold across the Americas, 12 of which um, were actually spent at tech, which is where I work. Um, and she's of course, particularly well known um, for her work in Carlin style gold deposits south of the border. So prior to her position uh, at Liberty Gold, she was chief geologist at Frontier Gold and was really instrumental in the advancement um, of the Long Canyon deposit in Nevada. So as I mentioned before, um, she's very engaged in, in the geoscience community and, and is the president-elect for the Society of Economic Geologists, which is very exciting for her and for all of us. And um, she's no stranger to the MEG. So I think today's is lucky number eight presentation, which is certainly a record for MEG presentations. And she was also um, an, active, an active part uh, of the MEG um, in the past. So without any further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, you can share your screen, Moira. Great, thank you very much. And uh, hopefully you'll stay on in video because it'd be nice to uh, um, actually be talking to somebody. Um, let's see here, if I can find presentation. And second. All right, can everyone hear me and see that? Hopefully that's the case. Perfect. So, Clear. All righty, so yeah, um, I have been uh, doing this for MEG for quite a while and of those eight talks, um, it represents four deposits that are now in production as well as one in development. And I am absolutely convinced that uh, we have two more here, um, one of which I'm going to speak about today that uh, is going to be a mine in the not too distant future. So here we go. Um, this is a, uh, it's a little bit of a lag here. This is a technical talk, um, not a corporate one, but I still have to put this up and state that forward looking statements will be made. Um, and no talk these days is complete without an ESG slide and Liberty Gold is committed to um, the environment, to health and safety and to good governance. Um, before I dig too much into this, I'm just the speaker here and um, I wanted to share the names of the Great Basin Black Pine technical team. Um, this is all the uh, regular Liberty staff, as well as our awesome consultants and contractors. It truly takes a village. And this is without putting up the names of all of the corporate function uh, in Vancouver. And without everybody in Vancouver, we wouldn't be doing our job. So um, it's definitely a collaboration amongst a lot of people. So a little bit of uh, context here before we go right into Black Pine. Black Pine is located in the Northern Great Basin and uh, it's in Southeastern Idaho right here. I hope people can see my cursor. Um, and uh, most maps don't even really acknowledge that um, Idaho has a piece of the Great Basin in it. Um, and uh, this map I put together about five or six years ago before we um, got the Black Pine property. And you can see that um, I haven't even labeled Idaho on here. But the point here is that sedimentary rock host and gold deposits, um, most of which are Carlin type deposits, are found throughout the Great Basin. They're kind of bracketed uh, by the Strontium 706 line on the west. And that marks the, the bitter edge of the Proterozoic post rift. Craton, and then uh, also bounded by the edge of the Great Basin and the Wasatch Front here on the on the east side. Um, this is the Carlin trend right here, and this is the Cortez trend, and uh, those are where most of the Carlin type deposits are located. And in particular, in this area with the green dots, which are mostly Devonian um, 
post rocks on the continental margin and slope. But uh, more and more, we're finding deposits that go from deeper water into shallow water onto the shelf. And the shelf of deposits are mostly in this area here. They're not as numerous as in the main trends, but I think that's mainly a function of people not going out and looking for them. Um, another bit of context here, the target here is a bulk tonnage open pit oxide gold deposit. And for people that aren't familiar with working in the Great Basin or with Great Basin deposits, they're sometimes shocked at the grade of them. And so here's a list of mainly operating mines, few in development, and uh, the average random mine resource grade uh, is about 0.5 grams per ton with an average gold recovery of about 70%. There's one freak of nature in here, that's the Long Canyon deposit that uh, our crew developed and sold to Newmont about 10 years ago. And it has a reserve grade of about two and a half grams, but this is a freak of nature. But that freak of nature is also one of the lowest, if not the lowest cost operating mines in North America. So these mines can and do op operate profitably down to very low average grade and cutoffs. So keep those numbers in mind as we go through this presentation. So we acquired Black Pine in 2016, middle of 2016, and we acquired it from Western Pacific Resources Corporation for about $800,000, some shares of Liberty Gold and a 0.5% NSR. And I hope that when I'm, by the time I'm done, you'll be convinced that this was a really good deal. Um, at Liberty Gold, we have a philosophy of looking for projects that are already substantially de-risked. And so the way we do that is by looking for historical production. Um, that gives us a proof of concept of mining and metallurgy in a low price environment. And that is certainly the case at Black Pine. It operated in the 1990s. We also like the idea of substantially leveraging our exploration dollars by compiling other people's drilling. So they, they spent all the money and did all the work and we can capitalize on that. And this is certainly a data rich environment. There's over 1800 historic shallow drill holes. And of these over 1400 of the holes have unmined gold mineralization. So this is a great way to kick off your project. Um, another thing we look for is size. And at this project, we could see gold and soil anomalies over 14 square kilometer area. So um, that's a, a good, um, indication that we're dealing with a very large deposit. So zooming into the project area, this is a map of our tenure. The orange here are uh, federal load claims. There's about 50 square kilometers under claim. So it's uh, very large. And then the black and the green are areas that are not open to staking, but we are in the process of applying for them. These are um, not areas we necessarily think there's gold mineralization, but we're need, gonna need a lot of flat spots to put uh, mine infrastructure. The gold um, system itself is outlined in red here and the dots are uh, drill holes with gold mineralization. And the area right in the middle here, um, it looks kind of like kids band-aids stuck on a, a dancing bear. Um, that's the area that we've most intensively drilled. Um, from a contextual standpoint, it is 15 miles from or 15 kilometers from a freeway. This goes down the Salt Lake City. There's power right to the property boundary. There's a shallow water table in the basin, and you can see the bathtub rings from the Great Salt Lake right here. But there's no water in the mineralized area in the drill holes or the pits. There's also no perennial streams. There's no fish. There's no timber, there's no endangered species. It's a previously disturbed view shed. People have been driving by it for 25 years and they've kind of gotten used to that view. The mineralization is thoroughly oxidized, so we don't anticipate any acid generation. So for us, this is like the, the perfect storm of, um, we're not seeing any impediments to, to permitting and hopefully it won't take very long. The Black Pine Mine, this area, um, 
mining started life in the late 1800s with some small base metal showings, but the gold part of the story starts in 1950 with a small mining operation. And then in 1964, which is about the time that the Carlin um, oxide system was discovered, exploration was carried out by a number of companies. The last and the best was Naranda. Um, they did some great geology, discovered the ore bodies that were later mined, did a feasibility study, and then sold the project to Pegasus Gold. Pegasus Gold mined this project from 1990 to 1997. They went bankrupt on uh, the back of an operation in uh, Australia. Um, they walked away from the project. The Forest Service seized their bond and reclaimed it. So then it stood open for about 10 years and the open ground, which is amazing to me, the open ground was staked by Western Pacific Resources. They did a bit of exploration there, but they were lacking about two thirds of the drill database. Um, and then it was sold to us in 2016. And about a week after that, we, were, we covered the rest of the data, which was a real game changer for this project. The Pegasus operation was a valley fill run a mine heap leach. You can see the old heap leach here, which is now reclaimed. About 660,000 ounces were mined. About 435,000 ounces were recovered. The average grade was about 0.63, and the average recovery was about 65%. And we see this as a bare minimum, and we see lots of upside in that recovery number based on our own metallurgical studies. This is a summary map, and there's a lot of data that is distilled down on this map. Um, first of all, the gold and soil anomaly here is shown in purple. You can see the scale bar down here. This is absolutely enormous, and we think it's the largest gold and soil anomaly in the Great Basin that does not have an operating mine sitting on top of it right now. Um, <clears throat> then we have abundant historical and mine gold mineralization, and that's represented by these gold splotches on here, which is a well-constrained leapfrog model. Um, this is showing all the historical drilling um, that is unwind as well as our drilling through the end of last year. Um, then we have the pits here. Here are the pits, and they um, occupy a pretty small volume of what we think is the overall gold system here. Um, 660,000 ounces mined out of those pits. And when you look at them in the context of the greater gold system, it's hard to imagine that this is not a multi-million ounce system we're sitting on here. The gray line on here outlines the uh, current permit boundary. It's about 7.3 square kilometers and as well, we're amending the permit so that we'll get this stuff in the pale green color here. That'll bring our total permit area to about 12 square kilometers and lots of room and lots of uh, disturbance so that we can drill lots of holes. We spent about two years doing data compilation and modeling before we really jumped into drilling. And that was carried out by uh, Will Lepore who did a superb job. In 2019, we jumped in with both feet and we focused on a one square kilometer area and that's shown here. And in the process of drilling there, we made two discoveries of new zones, which are cleverly called D1, a Northwest training zone here and D2 um, in yellow. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, then we just we got a good template for um, what kind of the controls there are on mineralization. And then in 2020, we wanted to give it a more comprehensive test. So some of the targets are aligned with these uh, red stars here. And are very early on in our 2020 drilling, we uh, discovered what we call as the D3 zone outlined in blue here. And as well, we were able to extend the D1 zone quite a ways to the Southeast. Um, so, uh, so far, so good. Um, we're hoping to get a resource estimate out in probably the end of Q1 2021. And as well, we're doing metallurgical testing and drilling, um, as well as preliminary hydrologic engineering and baseline studies, et cetera. And um, even though we are pre-resource, we are 
absolutely certain this is going to be mine. And so better to start those things early so that they don't add up to delays down the road in terms of uh, um, pre-feasibility study and permitting. So backing up again here, uh, as I mentioned, this is in the far northeastern basin and range. Um, here's a, kind of an old map of the property boundary right here. And this is the Black Pine Mountains. Um, they're underlain by Devonian to Permian shelf, foreland basin, and platform strata. All of this was thrust imbricated in the late Cretaceous severe orogeny, and some of that deformation might date back to another orogenic event in the mid Jurassic. So then things really changed in the early Cenozoic, and these thrust faults were reactivated as normal faults. And Extension continued throughout the Cenozoic um, with deformation becoming progressively steeper and more brittle. I've got this orange box around that to remind me to say that uh, the gold mineralization is, uh, we think, probably roughly e early Eocene at age and more or less uh, coeval with uh, all the mineralization that took place on the Carlin trend. So the this whole area here, this whole mountain range, sits in the hanging wall of the Albion Raft River metamorphic complexes, and that's located right off to the west here. So, um, unriffing of that was about 20 million years ago. So, it's highly likely that uh, um, whatever the source of the gold mineralization is, this has been decapitated and, in a relative sense, moved um, up to tens of kilometers eastward. The latest deformation is associated with basin and range faulting from these mountain ranges and valleys, and that continues to this day. Zooming in a little bit more, this is an old map, but it, it serves its purpose here. Um, what we see is uh, the Pennsylvania to Permian ochre group, and uh, the, what we call the middle plate, um, and that's just relative to what we see on the property. This is all Pennsylvanian calcareous strata right in the middle here. And it's overlain on three sides by uh, Permian sandstones in the upper part of the upper group. And then all of this is overlying what we call the lower plate, which is Mississippian strata. And that is on a relatively flat fault that underlies everything here. And it actually pokes out in a few places uh, in the middle of the property here. Important thing is that middle plate carbonate rocks um, all host gold mineralization and uh, stuff overlying and underlying is relatively barren. And you can see the, the old pits here um, corresponding to the outcrop of the middle plate. Taking a little bit deeper dive on stratigraphy, um, we see a lower plate. Um, it's mainly Mississippian rocks. Um, and those record a transition from a shallow platform to a distal foreland basin recording the antler orogeny, which took place further to the east, to the west. The middle plate of the ochre group here, um, Pennsylvania in age, and this records really complex sedimentation patterns in a shallow water carbonate platform setting. And we have periodic siliciclastic sediment input from the east uh, off the craton. Um, then finally, it goes to basically uh, all siliciclastics in the Permian, and there's a thick sequence of this um, upper plate sandstone here. Um, I've got uh, two sections on here. One is our formation groupings, and the other is lithologic uh, groupings, and you can see that it's very complex. And each one of these formations is um, more or less a package of different strata with one being dominant. So for example, with this dolomite down here, um, there is dolomite in it and uh, there's a lot, but there's still a lot of other things. So um, take these set of seas with kind of a grain of salt. And again, middle plate carbonate rocks are the preferred host gold host rocks. And as it turns out, they host gold mineralization in many areas of uh, Western Utah. These stars here are meant to represent the relative uh, goodness of these rocks for hosting gold mineralization. So this dark green PLLC unit is uh, the best house rock in here. Um, 
you'll see this blue, purple, green, yellow over and over again in this presentation. So getting into the field here, um, if you were to drive the freeway down from Boise or Twin Falls or up from Salt Lake City, you get off the freeway, you're, you're headed toward the property and looking west, this is what you're gonna see. Um, this top image here is a schematic fence section. It's a, basically a cartoon that just generally shows what the main players are here in terms of the geology. So the brown here, again, is the lower plate shale, not a good host rock. The uh, yellow on top here is a little clip of uh, the upper plate sandstone, also not a go good host rock. But in between, we have this beautiful thrust implicated package of different kinds of carbonate rocks. It's about 400 meters thick at its thickest. And these are uh, conceptually areas of gold mineralization from historic drilling and uh, our own drilling. And you can see that gold mineralization extends from the very top of the middle plate to the very bottom here, over 400 meters. And then this is about four kilometers long from um, south to north. And so what we have here is a very big sandbox to play in, in terms of finding gold mineralization. On this lower slide, it shows the D1, D2, and D3 discoveries. And then this red outlines the area that we're uh, um, doing drilling this year to try and get a better handle on the overall size of the um, gold system here. So we talked about stratigraphy a little. Now let's talk a little about um, structure. These are some of the most messed up rocks that I personally have ever worked in. And so the first thing we see here is effects of the late Cretaceous severe fold and thrust belt. And this is the architecture upon which the gold system was superimposed. And uh, some of this might be, date back to the middle Jurassic, but things are not well dated here. Um, first thing we see are phase one east to northeast virgin thrust faults and recumbent folds. And so here's a beautiful example in a pit wall of one of these recumbent folds. And uh, I just want to say that uh, without these pits here, the outcrop is really poor here. And I just, I'm always amazed at how well the Durand geologists did um, because. <clears throat> We, they didn't have the pits and most of the drilling in the Great Basin tends to be RC, so you're looking at a bunch of chips and you can just imagine somebody drilling a hole and drilling it right down the middle and getting mostly limestone and not a whole lot of gold and then stepping over 30 meters and drilling another hole and it's mostly in shale and getting a totally different story and how to put that story together. Um, it's pretty amazing. Anyway, I digress. Um, Phase two thrust faults um, are accompanied by open to upright folds. Um, this is a nice drag fold uh, um, in a small thrust fault here in one of the other pits. Then this, we move on to a Cenozoic extension. Um, this generally, the onset's about 42, say, million years ago um, with the extension and volcanism in the Great Basin. Early extension at black pine is relatively low angle and semi-ductile and likely reactivates thrust faults. But because all these different um, deformation events are roughly coaxial, it's uh, pretty hard to sort that out. Um, so anyway, here's another pit wall. Here is uh, a little inset that shows some nice semi-ductile shears uh, with the, these small lenses of uh, limestone um, in shale hair. Um, later extension is progressively more brittle. And uh, this latest fault right in here, um, here's a little inset showing it's just completely milled and this entirely brittle. So gold is spatially associated with low to moderate angle brittle faults. Um, we think those are about 37 to 40 million years old. Um, this uh, Inset down here is the same view in this upper photo, and we're looking at 3D um, gold assays in historic drill holds. And you can see that this POLB unit here is not very well mineralized. And then bang, you get into POLC, you see, start seeing a lot more brittle deformation in there. 
and the right kind of host rocks, a calcareous siltstone, and all of a sudden things really light up. So that brings up the concept of um, tectonostratigraphy. Each one of these packages of rocks, because they're different rock types, they also have different style of, of deformation. And that reflects on gold, which favors these brittle structures. So POLA is mainly massive sandy limestone. It's brittly deformed. And where it is, that makes a pretty good host rock. Pull B here is non-calcareous siltstone with these big lenses of limestone and dolestone that's shown in this pit wall down here. Most of the deformation is um, fairly ductile, and this is not a good host rock. PLSC, again, it's dark green unit. Um, it's a calcareous siltstone. There's lots of brittle deformation in it, and uh, that's an excellent host. PLD is mainly massive limestone and dolostone. It was uh, fairly resistant to deformation. It forms these big bulwarks, and uh, if there's no structure going through it, it's not a very good host. And then finally, this unit down here, PLS, is a calcareous siltstone that looks a lot like PLLC. And in fact, it might even be the same because um, it's uh, tough to sort that out with all the thrust faulting. That's also a good host. There's also a lot of breccias on this property. So they're extremely common. They range from tectonic to hydrothermal to collapse breccias. Collapse bridges are volumetrically the most significant and are spatially related to gold. Um, I call this kind of phenomenon a hydrokarst in that we see volume loss through dissolution of limestone forming these big cavities and then they collapse and you see infilling by calcite um, or other kinds of cement and matrix. So this is a gigantic example in one of the pit walls. So, even though Black Pine is located uh, um, several hundred miles away, well, a couple hundred miles away from the Carlin trend, I think this is a Carlin type deposit. And you can check the boxes. It's hosted in Paleozoic carbonate rocks, particularly calcareous siltstone. There's a spatial association of gold with brittle structures, which is a hallmark of uh, Carlin. Alteration includes decalcification, silicification, clay alteration, calcite cemented breaches and calcite veins. This is sort of the Carlin alteration fingerprint. Gold is associated with elevated arsenic, antimony, mercury, and thallium, which is the Carlin geochemical fingerprint. And then this whole system is pervasively oxidized um, with gold associated with iron oxide. Gold is mainly submicron, but we also see very small gold grains, and this is something that is pretty common in oxidized carlin systems as well. So here's a picture, it's showing a, a massive limestone in gray, that's not going to be uh, mineralized, but then there's a shear zone in here that's sheared up calcareous siltstone and a bunch of other stuff, and this runs about three grams. Here is some um, large diameter PUQ core um, that we use for metallurgy, and it's pretty much all gone now, but uh, we managed to save a few pieces of it uh, so we can look at it here. Um, these are different styles of alteration and mineralization. The highest grade samples are from a really nondescript looking, um, strongly decalcified calcareous siltstone. And it's ugly, but it does the trick. Um, you can see some other branches in here and uh, there's siltstone. Um, this one over here, there's a small dike that goes through here in, um, through brecciated rock, cross cuts it, but then down in the lower left here, we can see um, the same um, intrusive rock that is class in a breccia. We are in the process of seeing if we can date these uh, intrusive rocks, but they seem to be intimately related to uh, the, or at least coeval with mineralization. So here's a um, set of core boxes showing 7.3 meters, averaging 12.4 grams per gold. This is a strongly decalcified calcareous siltstone. Otherwise, it looks pretty nondescript, but it definitely does the trick. 
So for the remainder of this, I'm going to talk about the three new liberty discoveries and in the process to get an idea of what these zones of mineralization look like. Um, as I mentioned, 2019, we focused on a one square kilometer area, kind of right in here. And then in 2020, trying to get a more comprehensive test of the area. And one of the first places we drilled was this D3 area in here. So we're starting to pull things together into what we hope is going to be one big pit someday. Um, this is just a list of drill results from our last couple of years, current to a couple of months ago. And uh, the white in here are uh, historicals that still have gold mineralization in them, but other otherwise this is all our drilling sorted by gray tub thickness. And you can see some really nice thick intervals with really nice grades. And again, I would uh, point you back to that slide from the beginning of the presentation where the average grade of um, random mine heat bleach operation is about 0.5. Um, Long Canyon, the freak of nature is about 2.5 and uh, is a very low cost producer. So we think that these results are, uh, um, are really actionable results. Um, going back to our three new discoveries, um, this is uh, looking over the top of them, looking to the Southwest. And the reason we drilled in here in the first place is because in this B pit down here, we could see outcropping higher grade mineralization. And by that, I mean, you know, something over a gram in the pit high wall. We could see the same in the A pit high wall here. And then over in this A basin area, it had been drilled, but never mind. And there was high grade virtually outcropping mineralization there as well. So we thought if this is one, stratigraphic unit and it extends under this whole ridge, we could end up with a very large deposit here. Um, the truth is a little bit more complicated than that, but um, that's basically what we, we found. So this is a map of that area, zooming in on D1, D2, D3, and uh, these are 3D drill assays and anything purple is better than a gram. And you can see a lot of that material in here. Um, I'm going to show you a section here that looks to the north-northwest and cuts obliquely across all three of those zones. Um, the top of this, the first image, is showing the status of things after Naranda's drilling and uh, Pegasus drilling to find these outcropping oxide gold ore bodies. Um, and a hallmark of drilling back in those days when there was $300 gold is they drilled a lot of really closely spaced holes, but they're all basically 100 meters deep. So they defined two outcropping um, higher than average grade ore bodies here. The central one shows what it looked like after they mined it, the B pit and the A pit, and uh, they left a lot of mineralization in the high walls as well as underneath the pits. Then the bottom image shows what happened um, current as of a couple months ago when uh, Liberty Gold came in and said, hey, let's let's drill a little bit deeper. So now we have uh, D1, D2, and D3, these beautiful zones of higher than average grade. Um, and uh, this is primarily in that POLC, the dark green unit, and this is primarily in that uh, um, pill blue unit. So the idea here is this is a big ridge and hopefully we can just mine it right down to that lower plate contact in the bottom here and basically take everything. There's a lot of lower grade mineralization between the higher grade zones and that should uh, impact the strip ratio positively. Now looking at uh, these sections with a little bit of geology on them, this section is a long section through the D2 zone and a cross section through D1 and D3. And you can see that most of the mineralization in D2 and to some extent in D1 is in that dark green POLC calcareous siltstone. And then D3 down here is in the lower unit of calcareous siltstone. This is a long section down D2. This is about two kilometers long now. And uh, 
it's a pretty wide section, so we're catching a piece of T2 as well under the historic feed pit, but you can see outcropping mineralization in a basin comes across under this historic B pit and then down to uh, a third pit, the Tallman pit down here where uh, the whole story starts. And for some reason, there was about a 400 meter long gap in here and no drilling under the historic pit. And so that's what we're in the process of filling in right now with uh, some very nice results. Our current drill focus, in addition to the regional drilling, is this D3 discovery. This is from a couple months ago um, when we were drilling away on this new discovery. And you can see one, two, three drills. Here's a map with an insight showing um, what the geology looks like and the assay results and some of the highlights of drilling here. So let's step back a little bit further and look at the, the big picture from a property scale. These are two and a half kilometer long sections. And we just looked at a piece of this section here, um, the middle a little bit further to the south and then down all the way down through the um, southernmost two pits here. And um, the, the obvious takeaway from this is that um, where we've drilled, there's lots of gold and this, uh, Dark green unit in particular is a preferable host rock. Um, where we've drilled in this light blue unit here, um, there's also a lot of gold in the drill holes um, in all three places. And in fact, this sea pit was actually uh, mined some of that. But outside of that, there's very little drilling. And so hopefully as time goes on, we can fill in all the blank spots on this map and we'll discover more zones that are like D2. And D3. Now we're going to take the bird's eye view and look at things on a regional scale. This is a seven kilometer long section line through all of our targets. And uh, looking at the pancake level here, you can see strong preferred orientation, um, northwest turning zones in a few places, and also um, a, um, northeast, southwest. Uh, preferred orientation of gold. But if you pancake every single drill hall onto this single section and you turn it and you look at it end on, you can see that all the gold mineralization in essence is uh, in various lenses inside this metal plate and it forms a 15 degree dipping dip slope for most of the extent of it. And uh, so everything is within about 400 meters of the surface and hopefully within reach of an open pit. You can see some big gaps in here, like this one here, which corresponds to this area here. This is where there's a shallow um, piece of the upper plate that was masking any gold mineralization. And there's a few really shallow holes in here that were condemnation holes for the, um, the old heat bleach pad. But almost no drilling. So this is the area that we're finishing up the permitting on and we expect to be in there next year. We have every reason to think that this gold mineralization just extends under surface and then pops out on the range front down here. So if there's a, one takeaway from it, it's that we've already defined a lot of gold, but there's still large volumes of untested and highly prospective stratigraphy that remain laterally and and a depth uh, relative to the existing drilling. So that's my formal presentation. Um, love to get some questions. I have actually have one more um, slide in here, and that is metallurgy. If anybody uh, wants to talk about metallurgy, so anyway, that's it. Thank you so much, Moira. That was really great. Um, maybe I'll jump in with one question to, to get us started, which is probably really easily answered. I'm just curious, um, the, the database, you said I think a third of the database was originally missing, the, the Pegasus um, database that uh, the company before didn't have when they were exploring. How did you recover it? Or is that something you're allowed to talk about? It seems like something really? that, that happens a lot for companies is they've got yeah. this data there's actually a really interesting story behind that. Um, they, when after the sale of the project, I went to get the paper data and they handed me a hard drive and said, you have everything on this hard drive. 
um, but I'll give it to you anyway. Here, take it. So I put it on the server. I called Will Lapore up, and um, he got to work valid, you know, verifying that it was the same data that we'd already been given. And he found this obscure file folder that said Forest Service on it and uh, opened it up. And there was all these old files and weird for file formats. And it turned out that the previous operator actually had all the data the whole time, kind of like the Ruby Slippers and the Wizard of Oz. Um, and uh, they didn't know it. So classic. That's one of those. Works for moments. you. Yeah. You. We, yeah. uh, we, we already have um, a couple people lined up for questions, so I'll just go in order here. Just remember to unmute yourself when I um, call on your, your name. So William Galen, I hope I said your name correctly. Um, why don't you ask your question? Hi, Bill. Got to unmute yourself. There it is. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yep. Okay, uh, what's the composition? Uh, you got a good look at those dikes and things that are associated with the mineralization. What do they look like in in the uh, ore zone? They are the ugliest, grottiest things you've ever seen, and uh, we have no idea what the original composition of them is. Um, I'm actually going to do a little bit of whole rock on them and see if that helps. Then maybe the trace elements can give us a little bit of a clue of what they are. Um, they're just so altered, you can't really tell. Um, they tend to be really small, like, you know, maybe 10 centimeters wide. And the biggest one we found is about three meters wide. Uh, and it's still just awful. Um, sometimes they're mineralized, sometimes they're not. So they're kind of a passive host. But um, then there's another um, type of dike that is uh, strongly silicified probably fairly felsic with this brassy pyrite in it that um, it's uh, transitional into the lower plate in terms of where we find them. So we're going to try and date that too and see what happens. Because there's very, there's quite a lack of then those grungy dikes. There's a lack of intrusive rocks in the, in the package there, correct? Um, we thought so, but uh, you know, in that APID and that uh, breccia thing that I showed, there's actually quite a few dikes in there and when we started drilling PQ core, that's when we started picking up in some places they're extremely numerous, but since they're only like 10 centimeters wide, they tend to get swamped when you're looking at a um, RC chip. So it may be more common than we think. Okay, thank you. Great, uh, on to the next question from Dave. Dave Gill. Yeah, uh, mute. Can hear you. You're, yeah, you, you, can you hear me now, Moira? Yep. Okay, thanks. Great presentation. Um, it's kind of um, Bill kind of already asked my question, but it was basically on those um, on the intrusive relationships and, and what you're seeing for, um, I guess, what could be the source. Uh, you kind of touched on it that you think it might be a detached panel um, and that you're you might be removed from source. But I guess my question was, um, you know, how much. Um, how much intrusive do you see within the stratigraphic sequence? And, um, you know, bigger picture, you see the, uh, the isochrons of, of the various sort of Eocene, um, uh, I guess, magnetism get successfully older as you go to the north. And I just wondered how that fits in. But it sounds like you're trying to answer those questions now with your, with your geochron. That's correct. Uh, and uh, sending those samples off probably later this week to University of Arizona. And... Uh, they actually managed to pull zircons out of uh, um, intrusive rocks from Gold Strike that I never thought was possible. So I'm hoping they can work their same magic here because um, they're um, they're pretty pretty awful looking. But if I had to guess, they're going to come back uh, somewhere around 37 to 40, just based on regional relationships. I hope they do because that kind of nails the Carlin thing. Yeah, but 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 I guess not a lot of uh, intrusive rocks in your overall sequence is what you kind of summarized, or what the, is the, is the key takeaway from the talk? Well, we didn't think there was uh, until we started uh, hitting them. They're fairly numerous in uh, in core drilling, um, and so there's a lot more there than we thought. But you just don't really see it in the um, in all the RC drilling. So um, locally, they're quite numerous, and actually. 
I guess I can, well, it's probably too much of a pain, but that uh, one photo I showed of the big bridge of body, um, there's actually quite a few dikes in there. Um, but that's true of virtually every Carlin system. Um, there's some. Yeah, okay. Thanks very much. Great, uh, great talk again. Thanks. All right, Bill, back to you for another question. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Mark. The, there was a paper, and I don't remember the name of the paper, uh, of, of, of some kind of a mafic dike that was sampled along the range front uh, to the south of the deposit that supposedly returned an age date of 7 and 8 MY. Did, did you ever find that? Um, no, but now that you mention it, we'll go look for it. Yeah. Um, what was the age? 7, 8 MY. 78? Seven, no, 7 or 8 MY. Or somewhere, or eight. Yeah, it was yes. um, or Nevada age minerals, uh, uh, age on the, on the intrusive and dike. So there is a, um, a fair bit of volcanics in the area, not immediately at Black Pine, but in the region that are uh, um, fairly young. And uh, so it might not be related to mineralization, yeah. but worth looking up anyway. Thanks. Yep. Bye. Uh, we've got a question from Tim Baker. Go ahead. Hi, Moria. Tim here. Great talk. Um, just a quick question on the metallurgy. Um, I, I, you always think of oxidized deposits have having very good recoveries, and I guess um, these are down at sort of 70%. I was just wondering what are the challenges around metallurgy with these types? Hey, well, thank you for asking. Um, <laughs> so uh, um, we've done a fair bit of metallurgy already, and actually we're uh, looking at doing phase three metallurgy here, and we were able to recover a uh, metallurgical work done by Naranda at the same lab using the same technique. So we're getting quite a body of uh, metallurgical um, data here. Um, we have done six surface bulk samples with uh, large diameter columns as well as 29 variability composites from the core so far. And uh, what we see is um, quite a range in there, but the weighted average um, extraction relative to grade is about 82%. And the gold extraction is really rapid. So we see virtually all the gold recovered like in the first 10 days of leaching. And uh, there is quite a range here. And what, what we're piecing together is that some of this stuff is great. Um, run a mine, no problem. Some of it has a fairly high clay content and it's going to need uh, probably crushing and agglomeration um, to really reach its full potential. That was actually something that Miranda um, figured out, but when Pegasus mined it, they just put it all in a heap leach pad. There is a bit of preg robbing here and there, and uh, that was one of the things that uh, happened in the original operation and definitely negatively impacted um, things early on in the mine life. And so those are areas that we're going to have to define and send to the waste dump. Um, so uh, there doesn't seem to be any silica encapsulation in here. It's one of the flattest curves um, our uh, metallurgist has ever seen in terms of going from small particle size to large particle size. So we don't really see any issues going forward, um, but some of the ore will likely need some crushing and agglomeration and we'll need to um, avoid those, the black death, the, the areas that might be prey grabbing. Thanks very much, it's great. All right, I don't see uh, any more questions uh, lined up here. Um, maybe just a last call for anybody. Gotta be questions, come on. <laughs> what's, what's that, sorry? There's gotta be questions. <laughs> Everyone's asleep. No, I, I definitely don't think so. Um, I, I, I might just ask, and, and this might be a very naive question, but um, it, why is the gold grade um, higher? at Black Pine overall than um, so many of the other oxide deposits? Is, is there a, a process that you can point to? Um, 
Well, I think what we see here is a range in gold grades. So I've been highlighting the areas that have a higher than average grade, but it's inside this sea of lower grade mineralization. And uh, so, you know, in terms of mining, you're going to start with the higher grade er areas where there's a low strip ratio and uh, then gradually bring in the lower grade stuff uh, later in the operation. So by the time that operation is done, you might add, you might end up somewhere close to the average grade of a, an oxide heat bleach. Um, and, you know, Long Canyon, um, the rocks are really tight. And so the, the gold bearing fluids uh, were pretty constrained and they couldn't get out, leak out into the host rocks. But uh, in here, this whole um, package of rocks is absolutely shattered. And it's kind of interesting because we see um, holes where the only below detection assays are the blanks um, and range from zero all the way up to a uh, higher grade. So it's about compartmentalizing the higher grade areas um, for payback of a mining operation and then mining everything else. Got it, thank you. Um, and we'll go to Jerry for a question and then we'll take one more question after that. Hi Maura, a really enjoyable talk. Um, I just wondered if you had any data on what the temperature of the fluids, the hydrothermal fluids were at Black, Black Pine and how they compare to the Carlin further west? We have no data. Um, this has been pretty much an economic geology, capital E uh, sort of exercise so far. And we're just now formulating how we're gonna, um, how we're gonna go forward. Um, it's really hard to work on oxidized deposits and get those kind of answers. But two of our core holes recently actually had just little lenses of, uh, um, of sulfide mineralization in them. And when uh, we get the assay results back and confirm that those are actually mineralized, I'm gonna send those off to uh, Jean Klein, um, who is uh, the queen of Carlin herself. And hopefully she can help us work through um, that and get to some answers about how closely this resembles Carlin. But right now, I couldn't even begin to answer your question. Thanks a lot. All right, and then we'll go to our last question here from Hansa. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Moira. Um, thanks for the talk. Really, really, really interesting. Um, and I, I was curious, you, you, you we're mentioning that uh, most of the rock is really, really shattered um, and, and broken into pieces. Um, and more practical question about um, the drilling. You did some PQ drilling and um, did you, you have a lot of issues actually um, uh, drilling through this kind of rock? No. Um, and we did PQ because we need a lot of material for those metallurgical column tests, but uh, PQ drilling, um, probably saved us in a lot of ways. Uh, I think is if we go down to a smaller diameter core, we will start having trouble getting through those rocks. But we're going to give it a try here uh, starting in a couple of days. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But uh, for the most part, um, with core drilling the, with PQ, um, things hold together remarkably well and we got excellent recovery, which is kind of slow. And also, also use a lot of water because uh, the rocks don't hold water at all. So uh, we have to keep uh, injecting water in there. Well, well, good luck with that then for the next Thank stage. You. Thank you. Great. Um, are you willing to take one more? We've got one more. Sure. I got all right. <laughs> Chris Thompson. Chris Thompson. Very last, last, last question. Hey there, hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. We're a great, uh, great talk. Uh, quick question, just um, have you identified any opportunity for a high-grade starter pit uh, at, uh, at Black Pine? And, uh, and, and can you just basically just give us a sense, looking at the metal plate rocks, on, uh, on, on where some of the high-grade opportunities exist? Um, so this is a long section of the D1 discovery. And uh, so better than one gram assays are in purple here. And uh, over on the left-hand side, this is the A basin area. And 
the higher grade stuff is basically outcropping. And then also in the historic bee pit, we see outcropping mineralization. So these would be good places to start with a relatively low strip ratio. Um, then, then some of these other slides um, show that uh, there's a strong stratigraphic control on where the high grade is located. And then finally, this slide shows uh, that there's also a strong structural control on where we see higher grades. So um, we are in the very early stage, of, like I said, we're pre-resource, but uh, we'll probably do a small scope scoping um, at the same time as we do the resource and look at how we, you would sequence um, pits to maximize getting into the higher grade portions of the deposit sooner than later to pay back your cost of capital. Great, Warren. Just another quick question. Um, obviously, huge opportunity here for, uh, for, for potential resource growth. But if you were to sort of pick a you know, a favorite, uh, I guess, target D1, D2, or D3. What do you think that, what, what, what target do you think has uh, got the greater potential delivering that? Greater remaining potential. Yeah. Because, um, uh, you know, we've, we've uh, done quite a bit of drilling in here. Um, in this uh, slide here, um, we are currently have a drill right in this area here, looking at the down dip extension of D1. Um, we're not finished drilling in this area here. And uh, as well, this is pretty sparsely drilled up in this area. So what we're hoping is to gradually just pull all of this together into you know, one, big, one big pit. And we think there's still a lot of potential there. It's hard to say about some of these other areas because they just haven't been drilled. Another target that I really like is um, this area in here, which corresponds to this big blank spot on the section. Um, and based on if the past is any uh, indication of what you're gonna find in the future, it sure seems like that there ought to be uh, um, areas in here that are really high potential. And you can see some of these um, zones like this one come down, does get offset down on our range front fault here, but it ought to pick up on the other side. So um, those are some of the areas that I like, but it's just so hard to say about some of these areas. Like up here, really sparsely drilled, the holes are 200 feet deep and they've got um, gold in them. Um, is there another one of these big zones lurking under this area? We just can't say. So um, it's gonna gonna take some more drilling. I know that wasn't very specific, but uh, it's uh, hard to not go off in all directions in here. That's good enough for me. Thank you very much, Mara. A good problem to have to have too many great targets to choose from. So uh, <laughs> on, on that note, um, just another really big thank you, sincere thanks from uh, all the MEG members for your presentation today and, and for also being our guinea pig uh, on Zoom. I, I actually think it worked uh, quite well. We had up to 110 participants, which is definitely higher than uh, most of our in-person uh, events. So this is really reaching a, a broader audience, um, even though it would be great to to be chatting and mingling uh, in person. So I wish I could, you know, finish off and give you uh, a bottle of wine right now. <laughs> um, but but I can't. So we'll save that for uh, when I get to meet you in person. Um, but thank you again. And just to all the, the people listening, please feel free to write uh, comments on, on how today went and the format uh, just in the chat before you leave. And uh, I'll try to compile them and, and use them to improve the setup uh, next time. So thank you again, Moira. And I, I wish we could clap. I'll clap. I don't know <laughs> if you can hear. <laughs> Thanks for letting us tell our story. Of course. And take care. And I'm going to be on for a little while. So feel free to stay on um, and chat if you'd like. All right, I'll stay on for a minute.